Welcome to Earth Science at Cary High School. I am Mr. Culp, and I will be working with you today. So today we are talking about temperature, salinity, and ocean acidification. So when dealing with the uh, oceans, we learn that we learn that thanks for my handy sidekick. Uh, we learned that there are several different layers of uh, ocean temperatures. As you would imagine, the warmest temperatures would be at the surface. That's where your sunlight penetrates. And as you go down, it gets darker. But at the same time, the temperature also decreases. Eventually, you make it to a point to the, known as the thermocline zone. This is uh, marked by a rapid temperature change with depth. So as you get to this point, it gets very, very, very cold very quickly. You'll notice that it's bolded. So this is definitely a topic to... A highlight markdown know that you uh, are going to study this at some point in the future uh, so surface temperature surface zone very warm thermocline gets rather cool very quickly and then the deep zone that's where your uh, scary scary sea creatures live uh, very cold very dark um, and then incredibly high pressure so it, it prevents most submarines from getting down there uh, so we really haven't discovered too much of it but that's, those are your three, three zones. What is ocean water? Uh, obviously, it is H2O, uh, about 96.5%. The other 3.5% is salts. Uh, most of you know that table salt is sodium chloride, but that's not the only salt that exists in the oceans. There's several different types of salts. If you've taken chemistry, you know uh, if you mix your group one elements with your halogens, they create salts. And if you have no idea what that means in two years when you take chemistry with Mr. McCullough, you will. So there's our, a breakdown of what they are. Um, and you may have seen this. This looks familiar to the activity you'll be working on today, and it kind of helps break down your percentages of different types of salts that we find in the ocean. Uh, salinity, the actual term salinity is the amount of dissolved salts present in ocean water. Um, all of you are used to dealing with percentages, which is parts per 100. But in salinity, we're gonna be talking about parts per 1,000. So if you have 1,000 grams of seawater, 35 grams are dissolved salts, or I like to think of it as if I took 1,000 molecules of seawater, 35 of them are gonna be salt molecules. So instead of doing, it's the same exact number as 33.5%, but we just express it as 35 parts per 1,000. So in the ocean, the salinity is not the same throughout. Several places are saltier than others. As you'd imagine, if you're increasing the salt, that could increase your salinity. If you decrease your salt, well, decrease your salinity. Uh, the much easier method is to change your amount of water. As you know, evaporation, you're removing water from the ocean. So as you remove water during evaporation, it tends to increase your salinity, right? There's the same amount of salt, but there's now less water. So salinity goes up. Well, the opposite must also be true. If we are taking water away is increasing salinity, then adding water must decrease salinity. So rainfall or melting of ice tend to decrease the salinity in an area. Um, that's why, well, that's why you'll notice that the lighter colors are near the poles. More melting ice glaciers are melting. This melt water makes it with ocean water to make less salty water. How the oceans became salty, you know, it's very ironic, but the oceans actually came salty from freshwater rivers. I know, it's amazing to think about. But what happens over time is that the rivers carry a teensy, tiny little smidge of salt every time they run out into the ocean. And it's not a lot, obviously it's not a lot because we call them freshwater. But over millions and hundreds of millions of years, this salt builds up and makes the ocean salty. Now, you may have noticed if you ever make sweet tea or uh, if you, no matter how much sugar you add to it, essentially some of the sugar is just going to start to build up on the bottom. So there's a limit to how much water can hold in terms of sugar or salt or anything else for that matter. So the oceans have reached their limit. No matter how much more salt we add to them, it will always stay at around, around 3.5%, 4%. They're not going to get any higher. So even though the oceans keep adding, or the rivers keep adding salt to the oceans, 
Um, for the next million, two million, ten million years, they're not going to actually get any salt here. They're going to stay at roughly around the same percentage. Ocean resources. So people near the ocean obviously are going to use it for food, but we also use it for water in terms of desalination. That's where we remove the salt out of the water by passing it through tiny filters which kind of screen the salt out. If you ever go to the beach, you'll notice that the water isn't completely clean. If you taste tap water, it tastes a little salty. Um, but for the most part, it's taken most of the impurities out of it. Ocean acidification. So uh, in this part of the, where I'm actually coming back to this slide, but it, essentially this slide simply shows that pollution leads up to the clouds, which leads down to the trees, creating ocean acidification. So what's happening is that excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere makes carbonic acid in the clouds. Well, that acid is going to rain down eventually into the oceans. Now, one little rainstorm of acid isn't going to do much to the oceans. But if you give thousands and thousands of rainstorms a day, or tens of thousands of rainstorms a year, over years and years and years and years, you can slowly change the pH of the ocean. And just a little tiny change can have a massive effect on the organisms there, specifically ones with shells, um, because they're made out of calcium carbonate. If you remember back to geology, when you learned about limestone, limestone is made of a calcium carbonate, and it reacts with acid. So these animals would have these calcium carbonate shells as the ocean water gets becomes more acidic over time, it slowly will eat their shells away and slowly make them more brittle and more likely to be, become sick. So there's our slide again. You have your pollution leading to rain clouds, which can negatively impact your forests, which creates more CO2 in the atmosphere, and then that eventually can lead to ocean acidification. Um, as you'll notice in this chart, as your Oh, you say, well, sorry. As your amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide goes up, your amount of seawater carbon dioxide goes up as well, and your pH goes down. So this is an example of shell formation and tiny little microscopic organisms. And with a normal pH on the left, you can see that their shells look good, healthy, nice, everything clean. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll notice that there's a, a decreasing pH, which means it's becoming more acidic. And as it becomes more acidic, their shells become more deformed and more sickly. So how does this hurt me and you? Well, obviously, this all has a, a huge impact on us. Uh, I rely on, on sea life. You rely on sea life. Uh, whole countries rely on sea life to keep their populations fed. So you, you have a disruption of food supplies. You also have economic losses. If I rely on a small business to help get me by, and my business is dealing with oysters or scallops or mussels or any other shell life creature, um, a loss of you know, species could hurt me financially. Globally, shell, uh, shellfish production reaches over $11 billion in United States money. So it's a big, big, big part of the global economy. And then just hurting small town USA people who rely on it as their livelihoods become more destroyed due to this social acidification, it can severely hurt them. All right, well, thank you for watching today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of class.